Hi, this is Ed Kohler with Extreme Networks, and we're back with another Fabric Connect video. This one's going to focus on stealth networking design practices. In the hands-on video series, I referred to stealth networking practice on several occasions, and that generated quite a few questions. So I thought I'd throw together this short design guide, a uh, video base, to allow someone to get a better idea of what a proper stealth design is all about. So what we're going to do is we're going to highlight the main technical aspects of stealth technology within Fabric Connect. What makes it stealth to begin with? But like all technologies, we have to understand the main design practices that you need to follow if you're going to maintain a secure hyper-segmented stealth network infrastructure. So we're going to provide some general practice guidelines and we'll review those with case plan examples. Pictures always make things easier. And then we'll have an additional section towards the end where we'll talk about security design guidelines to best leverage security technologies, particularly a demarcation such as firewalls and threat detection. And we'll talk a little bit about where we intend to go as extreme networks in this direction. So let's get the technical aspects underway first. One of the first principles to remember is Fabric Connect is built on a data plane that is based on IEEE 802.1 AH provider-based bridging, provider-based transport. It really introduces two things. It introduces first a MAC addressing hierarchy, the differentiation between a subscriber MAC and an actual core network switch MAC. And then it leverages that difference to create something called a MAC and MAC encapsulation or a tunneling methodology. And it's basically by the separation that we can keep the user subscriber from the network service plane. So that's principle number one to remember. The secondary thing to remember is that all topological aspects of Fabric Connect are supported and maintained at the Ethernet forwarding play. Therefore, IP as a protocol plays no role in establishing the topology of the network or even the routed path behaviors as far as how traffic moves across. So that's another principle to remember. And then the final one is the fact that we do not allow any flooding or promiscuous forwarding within Fabric Connect. Instead, we use something called tandem replication within the Ethernet data plane, and that is actually invoked for a broadcast, unknown, uh, i.e. Mac learning, and also multicast. And as a result, these functions become localized and divided at the service edge. And that's a very good thing from a scaling perspective for layer two service domains, but it's also a very good thing from a security perspective as well. Now we use ISIS as the control plane for 802.1AH. And when I bring up the term ISIS, people often start to think about it in the traditional routing sense. It's important to understand that ISIS does not behave in this way. We don't move any user data in the traditional routing sense. Instead, it's used to program the link state databases that are resident in each Fabric Connect node. And this really leads to a very scalable, inherent distributed control plane for the Fabric. Now, user data moves through entities known as ICIDs, or individual service identifiers, and they provide for the Ethernet switch path directional graphs to support the data forwarding plane behaviors at the Fabric Connect level. Now, these circuits provide for the separation and control of the user subscriber base. There are two types. There are layer two and layer three. And in the hands-on video, we went through a L2 VSN. And in future videos, we'll give hands-on examples of eTree, uh, which is basically a uh, hub and spoke type of uh, private VLAN environment. And then also transparent, which is a ISA deport type mapping. And uh, that, that provides more or less a, a pipeline, if you will. And then switched UNI, which is a handy little feature to uh, switch VLAN identifiers within a single element for multi-tenancy and things of that nature. Uh, we'll have hands-on videos for those examples in upcoming series. But uh, right now, understand that the L2 service is really nothing more than VLANs or ports that are associated with an ISID. And then we have our Layer 3 services, which are the L3 VSNs. And as we will also recall from the hands-on video, Video. They are nothing more than VRFs that are paired together with a common ISID, and that creates a common VRF IPVPN entity. 
So this graphic shows a little bit more detail of what goes on at the user to network interface edge of Fabric Connect. Uh, on the outside of the cloud, we have our customer VLANs and our customer Mac environments, and that's either individual frames or queued tag trunks that are ingested into the user network interface. And that is basically accepted as a payload within the 802.1 AH service frame. Now, there are some minor differences between what happens between layer two and layer three type services, but the main concept is consistent here. It's the fact that there is this service separation that occurs at the user to network interface. And then we append a header into the 802.1 AH service frame, which provides all the forwarding information required. So really the customer frame becomes payload, whether it's an IP packet or a L2 ethernet frame. And there are two types of header information. We have the tunnel identifiers and the service identifiers. The tunnel identifiers are represented by the backbone MAC addresses of the SPB switches, and this is the destination source addresses, obviously, and then also the backbone VLAN IDs. And if we will recall, we set up the ISIS system IDs, which are equivalent to the BMACs, and also the backbone VLAN IDs in the, in the hands-on video. Those basically serve as the tunnel identifiers, and the individual service identifiers themselves, the ICIDs, provide the service identifiers in the context of that tunnel. So that's basically the way to look at what happens at the user to network edge and then note the expansion of the service space to the default fact that we're using a 24-bit flat identifier uh, and kind of breaking and exploding the AD boundary. This is a more intuitive way to look at this where we see that the CMAC frame is generated at the edge of the network encompassed as payload into the BMAC frame. We have the destination and source BMAC addresses, the BVIDs and the ICIDs, and they provide all of the forwarding information to be handled across the 802.1 A8 service domain. Note down below, I am illustrating the fact that we have different MAC levels. The CMAC level, which is at the subscriber edge, and if we will recall from the hands-on series, uh, connectivity fault management, these would be levels six and seven. And then the BMAC level, which is what we term as the SPBM level, and that would basically be handled at CFM levels four and under. And this shows that inherent separation of the user subscriber edge from the service core. Now, we need a control plane in order to orchestrate the behaviors of the Ethernet switch paths and the ICID. So as services get provisioned, services get modified, this information can be effectively coordinated across the fabric in a holistic fashion. And that's really what ISIS does for us. But it's also important to compare it against the legacy control model. If we look at the legacy layered approach, we have different control planes for each individual protocol, and we really need to string all of these services together to provide the end-to-end -end service chain multiple protocols. What that means is that if we misprovision something, it affects the whole service chain. The other thing is, is that we have a failure or trouble in a lower-lying portion of the protocol stack, the whole service can collapse like a house of cards because we have this top-down vertical dependency not only within the actual provisioning and setup, but within its operation as well. This is a key critical difference with Fabric Connect as we have an independent control plane through the use of ISIS. It programs the SPBM link state databases that reside in each Fabric Connect node. And we use and invoke a series of type blank values within a service layer, which define the different layer three and layer two services, and they are horizontally independent. When I'm in class with students and I'm doing my, my boot camps or my training, I always tell them that the best thing to remember is to have the analogy that a Fabric Connect network is like a wormhole or a black hole in physics. You have the concept of the fact that the fabric itself is based on the BBID, the BMAC, and the ISID values via Ethernet switch paths. So that becomes the black hole itself. And that is the service phenomenon that happens within the core itself. Service phenomenon at the edge, however, could be equated to an event horizon. And these would be your VRFs, your VLANs, your IP protocol, 
All of that service actually happens around the event horizon of the fabric core. Visibility of the service core from the service edge is not possible unless it's explicitly engineered. And we're going to talk about design practices to avoid that. And also, if you do need to do it, how you go about it. This wraps up all of the technical aspects. And this kind of brings us to the end of section one. From the upper left and then going clockwise, we see that we have the protocol construct of Fabric Connect itself, our 802.1 AH data plane, the use of ISIS as a control plane, and then the Fabric Connect service plane, which provides the explicit type like value extensions to enumerate the different services, which are all based on ISIS at the lowest level. We have ISIS providing a link state database synchronization that occurs across the whole fabric so that all link state databases are always in synchronous fashion within the environment. This programmable link state database also provides the ability to segment out the network infrastructure. So we end up, and remember, we do not support flooding or promiscuous behaviors, so we have a localized back learning and separation at the VSM level plus the ability of separation between local and remote learned MAC addresses. And this can very, very drastically impact the ability to do any type of ARP poisoning or ARP spoofing within the environment. And then finally, we have the Ethernet switch path based circuit service separation and the use of ICIDs provide that role for us. And this kind of wraps up the whole technical aspect. So we have a good foundational idea of the reason why Fabric Connect is a stealth technology in essence. But like all things, we have to understand the certain practices that need to be maintained in order to maintain a totally dark stealth environment. So with that, let's move forward to the next section, which are the design principles themselves. And they're fairly simple. Design principle number one is reserve the global routing table, i.e. VRF0, for management purposes only. Only IT mandated services, interfaces, and related subnets should be present on the GRT. And these would include, obviously, the Fabric Connect switches, the ISIS source IP addresses, most critically, and also any management interfaces you may have for those switches. XMC would be another candidate. Administrative interfaces for firewalls, threat protection, intrusion detection. This is really what the GRT should be reserved for and it should be built like a fortress. There should be no way in and no way out. And only IT mandated services should be allowed and only IT mandated users should be allowed. And this should be checked and validated on a regular basis. All users should be placed into a virtual service network that is not associated or attached to the GRT. Now, a lot of people struggle with this when they first install the fabric because they make it a big problem. They say, well, wait a minute, I gotta think about departments, I gotta think about this, I gotta think about, no. You really just need to create a single VRF at the Fabric install. They call it the Global User VRF, VRF1. All users are placed into their rel relevant IP subnets. As a matter of fact, you follow all of the seamless failover practices that we use, but instead of doing it against the GRT, you do it against the VRF. At that point of in instance, you've taken everyone off the traditional IP construct and you put them into the Fabric Connect environment, but instead of being on the GRT, they are now in a separate global VRF. Now, at that point, you can take weeks or months or however long you need in order to entertain further segmentation options using L2 VSNs and L3 VSNs. But at the first outset, get all of the users up and elevated off the environment so that the GRT is used for IT management only. And this diagram kind of gives us an example of two separate tenants that have been set up in the environment that have absolutely no connectivity to one another. And they have a uh, private internet environments. And then we also have some stealth L2 networks underneath that might be for an intelligent smart building. And perhaps these are tenants within the infrastructure or perhaps a government agency. And note that none of them have any access or connectivity whatsoever into the GRT. The GRT is a plane unto itself dedicated just for the management of the fabric. Design principle number two. As a result of design principle number one, do not assign IP addresses to VLANs that terminate L2 VSNs. 
because the IP subnet will appear in the GRT if you do. So when you run L2VSNs, do not assign IP addresses on them unless you intend on them to be in the global routing table. If you do require IP for L2VSNs, you can run DHCP within the L2VSN services. I actually showed that in the hands-on video. That's how I run my labs here. Uh, DHCP relay can also be used. I have many customers uh, that actually uh, can use this and point to security demarcations that provide for the service. And this principle more or less applies for all L2 VLAN terminated services. Note that, because that does not apply to transparent UNI. It's not a VLAN terminated service. Transparent UNI is a port terminated service. But it does apply to CVLANs, switched UNI terminations, as well as eTree. And this is a graphic example of what happens if we do assign an IP address to the VLAN terminating an L2 VSN. What happens is that becomes a GRT Layer 2 network. Only do so if you intend the L2 VSN to be used as part of the GRT and as a validated IT service. Design principle number three. When using multicast, try to do so within constrained domains of interest unless it is intended again for the IT management plane, i.e. the GRT. Ideally, each multicast environment should be separated and placed within separate L3 VSNs. A great example of a breakout that I see in airports, universities, I, I see it at casinos, are digital signage, video surveillance, and IPTV. Those are three different classes that ideally should be separated from one another. And this brings a vast degree of ease of management because I don't have to worry about IP multicast address conflicts. The L3 VSNs give me the full Class D address range available because there's complete and total separation. This is a great example of constrained IP multicast enablement. We can see that our top tenant has now gone ahead and taken the blue L3 VSN and enabled multicast. And as we recall from the hands-on video series, that was really three steps, setting the global parameter for multicast, setting it at the VRF level, and then enabling it at the individual VLAN IP subnet level as well. And with this, we provide for totally constrained, isolated multicast environments so that if the secondary tenant decided to, for instance, light up multicast on the green L3 VSN, these two would be ships of the night. They would be totally invisible. And, and that would give the case for even the first customer if they chose to light up multicast within the red IPVPN environment as well, provided they had the right policies at the service boundary, these two environments would be totally separate from a multicast perspective. But note again, nobody other than the IT and security administration are on the GRT, VRF0. This is our final design principle. And it's, it's actually kind of an exception because uh, there are instances where I've, I've, I've seen it needed to be done and, and it can be accomplished, but, uh, but I've also seen it done, you know, where leaks have been created inadvertently. So here it is. All three VSNs, really, when you have your VLAN, you should really keep it limited to the BEB service edge. Avoid extending long multi-hop tag Ethernet trunks off the VRF at the service edge because this can really compromise the Mac learning domain and isolation integrity that we talked about earlier. Do not use IP addressing on any of the VLANs that are resident in those service edge switches, i.e. the ones in the tag VLAN. Uh, and try to keep it li limited to one or two hops at the most. Also remember that you've gone ahead and you've disabled any L3 routing services at the edge, right? You've converted over to Fabric Connect. So the only IP address should be on the VLAN terminating the VRF within the BEB. If you do need to extend a subnet for a distance over multiple hops, then my advice many times is to loop back into the Fabric and use an L2 VSN. And when you do that, uh, you 
gain the benefit of keeping things fairly discreet, but also remember that uh, your VLAN terminations, uh, you, you really can't go and assign IP addresses because if you do, they will show up in the GRT and that's going to cause an issue, obviously for security purposes. Multicast is not supported on the far end L2 VSN service termination, so you have to realize that as well. And this should be viewed as a temporary service. It, it, it's kind of a patch. The longer term proper approach will be to get a proper L3 termination uh, and you should try to get that implemented as soon as possible. This is a good example here graphically of what happens. If you look at what we have, we have our red L3 VSN and what we're doing is we're taking a loop back from the backbone edge bridge back into itself. So this is really the same switch here. And we have an L2 VSN that uh, basically provides us the ability to map into a environment where we can extend the presence of this VRF subnet. Now, again, if we put an IP address on this far end VLAN, what happens is this will show up into the GRT. And then what will happen is users that are in this domain of interest would actually have capability and connectivity to the GRT. We obviously would not want that. So we use no IP addresses on any service extension. Again, I want to emphasize that this should not be viewed as a permanent solution. Ideally, you want to put a switch in place that is capable to terminate a VRF properly, and that's really uh, should be done as soon as possible. But the, this is a good intermediate approach, if you will, if, if you need to do it. Okay, so that's it. Four basic principles, and the fourth one is really an exception to rule. I mean, if, if you really follow the best practices, you should never have to do that. So really three design principles. But we have the concept of, you know, the demarcations, the firewalls, the threat protection. How, how can we leverage the technology in that light? Because there's been a lot of security philosophy debate between firewall companies and threat protection companies and in networking companies, and, and really the question is, is are, sh do they belong at the demarcation or do they belong everywhere? And the real answer is somewhere in between, folks. There is no absolute scope here. Uh, firewalls are very effective security components, but they do have limitations, and beware of the single solution to, uh, to security. I've seen people try to use firewalls as real-time networking probes. I've seen them used to enforce internal segmentation. That, that's actually a misuse of the technology, and it can lead to a, a pro proliferation of high capex and opex requirements over time. And you have the device management issues, the security policy issues, and it, it really can get out of control and out of hand, which makes compliance even more difficult in the longer run, which is kind of converse to what you're trying to do. Utilizing policy-based network segmentation is much, much more effective if you have the proper networking technology. With segments, you're either in or you're out. Traditional network segmentation approaches, as we all know, are very complex, but we've shown that Fabric Connect can make things a lot easier. So which approach makes more sense? Well, like I said at the beginning of the slide, it's really all in finding the right balance. We need firewalls, we need threat detection, but how do we leverage the network to work in complement with these vendors that we work with on a daily basis to best leverage Fabric Connect from extreme networks? So it really turns out that security segment domains are really what give firewalls purpose. When you think about it, if you're going to give a single port to every user from a firewall perspective, that can get a little out of hand. So we need to have security segment domains, and the segment domains need to be intelligent. I just give some examples here where we have a guest contractor access, you know, trolled access for different users, departments, perhaps critical access for emergency services, network management, you know, security, SOC, uh, compliance, PCI, HIPAA, CGIS, anything of that category. And really, in order to do this right, we need strong policy-based access control. And that really needs to allow us to know who belongs where and also what they're allowed to do when they're in those service domains. So we need strong monitoring of user systems, both in and out of the security segment. This is really where we come in tandem with the security industry and the devices that are out there. Fabric Connect from Extreme provides for a very efficient and effective technology for security micro segmentation. 
and strong monitoring of the network service edge. And when you take that and you marry that with security demarcation technology, it can become a very, very powerful mix for security segment domain management. Now, the other thing we have to remember is the basic concept of intrusion theory. Principle number one is that prevention is ideal, but detection is a must. Because if you have someone that's targeting you, particularly if you have someone that's inside that has decided to do something, you're not going to prevent it. They will intrude. The point is, is you have to have detection. And there's a few principles here that we need to understand is that, first of all, malicious data has to inf infiltrate the network. It has to come in the door in order for an incursion to occur. But preventing it is not always possible. You know, we have the rogue hotspots, the watering holes, uh, USB jump sticks for internal uh, phishing activities. All of these things can introduce malicious code. And we know that there's no way we're going to perfect totally eliminating that. But we do need to also realize a few other things that malicious code, particularly if it's an orchestrated type of environment, needs to establish a command and control. And it either needs to do so in a peer-to-peer -peer internally or it needs to phone home. Uh, and this can be immediately at the install or it can be delayed by time or it can happen at a specific application call. Maybe the next time you bring up an Excel spreadsheet, for instance. In either instance, abnormal data needs to move in or out of a given hypersegment within Fabric Connect. So given this, threat protection agents and intelligence is best placed at the ingress and egress to the hypersegments. So we've been working with a number of well-known security companies to create a closed loop security framework using hypersegmentation, stealth, and elasticity. And we're actually working further to give the ability to support intermediate service zones where we can actually spin up and spawn uh, security elements, virtualized containers and machines within the switches themselves. And this may be required for intermediate network level, intermediate zones for IoT type of instances where cloud and fog computing is becoming much, much more prevalent. And we're also working on the concept of highly segmented encryption free zones so that we can get the inspection uh, for certain services that require that either for governmental or legal purposes. And this works to the concept of data corralling. And this is the technique of forcing user data into particular security inspection zones. This can be used in the case of an L2 VSN that are anchored to security demarcation points. And uh, everyone coming in and out of that L2 VSN need to go through the security demarcation. The use of eTree services to enforce hub and spoke type behaviors. And this is a very common service that folks use uh, within Fabric Connect for PCI, for instance. It actually is ideal when you think about it. And then also the use of dedicated L3 VSNs to create private internet environments in the use of the constrained multicast domains earlier uh, was a great example of that. And then the use of extreme policy to control allowed rules for communication within the service itself. And this graphic kind of shows a great example of that where we have an L3 VSN and it's for a series of IoT medical devices, perhaps MRI type devices or rolling carts, whatever the case may be. And we have a L3 VSN within the Fabric Connect, our VRFs at the UNI boundary, feeding out into virtual LANs, which are within the OXOS environment. And then we have basically extreme policy at the edge which provides an explicit access deny, and then whitelist rules to allow individual discrete communications for the IoT environment. In this, this example, we have the ability for a web interface for the control and interface to the devices for the MRI information to the physician VSN. And then we have a closed port environment that's not allowed outside the L3 VSN at all, that only has access to the IoT server, which is managing the actual IoT devices themselves. This is a great example of how the two environments can work together, where we have the stealth black hole type Fabric Connect core, and then the Exos edge with very discrete conditioning of traffic before it's allowed to enter or exit the actual fabric. 
So in summary, stealth networking design principles are fairly straightforward and easy to leverage. Fabric Connect's simpler protocol architecture lends to an easier maintenance and security audit for secure domains of interest, and stealth hypersegmentation provides for a drastic restriction in lateral movement for malicious activity. Remember, there are two things that malicious activity needs, visibility and the ability to move. Within Fabric Connect, we provide no visibility and we provide very limited movement within the domain of interest. Data corralling can further allow us to better leverage security demarcation technologies to identify and isolate malicious activities when they do occur. And keep in mind that sooner or later, they will. Thank you very much for your time. And this should provide you enough information for you to design your own appropriate stealth domain. I'm Ed Kohler with Extreme Networks. Have a great day.